Hi everyone, welcome back to your weekly dose of the scariest creepypasta compilations. Before we start, I want to tell you about our special club, the Midnight Masters. If you join, you'll get extra spooky stories that only members can see. You'll also hear new stories before anyone else. By joining, you help us bring more scary stories. If you're ready for some scary fun, hit the join button below. For those brave enough to continue without joining, make sure to leave a comment about which story scared you the most. And of course, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so you never miss a new story. Now let's get started. Turn off the lights and get ready to be scared. On the morning of Mother's Day this year, I received exactly one gift. A dead rat, deposited at my doorstep by my cat, James. James is black and white, slick and elegant, his fur like a tuxedo. If a cat was cast to replace Daniel Craig in the next Bond film, James would be perfect. In fact, the resemblance is how he got his name in the first place. Thank you, James, I said, bending to stroke his fur as we both examined the little rotting carcass on the welcome mat. He looked up at me hopefully, as if expecting me to take a nibble of his offering. I'll get to that later, I promised. The rest of the family had forgotten the holiday, not that I blamed them. My husband Saito was busy at work, pulling 70-hour shifts as he prepared a series of PowerPoints to explain his company's corporate structure to a potential buyer. In the meantime, the twins June and Lily were busy with spring soccer and last-minute prep for their upcoming AP tests. I spent some time idly making myself coffee while the family slept. Then, around nine Sioux, they all flew past in flurry, the twins off to a soccer game, and Saito headed to the office. It wasn't until they'd all left that a lump began to form in my throat, and I headed to the backyard to have a little cry. I felt silly. It was a made-up holiday after all. Not like Christmas or a birthday, though Saito forgot my birthday too this year. For a few minutes I sat on one of the patio chairs, sniffling pathetically hoping no one returned early to see me like this. I was about to go back in when I saw James. He was over in the corner of the yard, lying in the shade. Right away, I could tell something was off about him. James always slept curled in a ball, his chin resting on his rear haunch. Today he was stretched out, bent awkwardly, even stranger. He seemed to shimmer in the few spots where the dappled sunlight caught his fur. Slowly, I walked over, clicking my tongue in the way he liked. When he didn't move, I softly called his name. Finally, I reached out to touch him, only to find his fur wet. Drawing my hand back, I found it red and bloody in the sunlight, which is when I started screaming. I called Saito a few minutes later. I need you to come home, I said. James is dead. Your friend James from college? Our cat! I realized I was screaming into the phone. Our only cat! I could practically hear him roll his eyes on the far end of the line. It's not a good day for this, he said. I can come back a bit early, take care of the body. Just leave it alone for now. I spent many hours alone that day, sitting in the backyard. In time, flies found James and began to lick at him with their little straw mouths, dipping their horrible little hands in his blood and rubbing them together. It was no use shooing them away. I was sunburned raw by the time Saito came home. He looked at me incredulous. What happened to you? I was standing vigil, I explained. He rubbed at the bridge of his nose. Where's the cat? He asked, and I gestured to the backyard. Every inch of my skin throbbed from the sunburn, but it felt right, like my inside and outside pain matched in some harmonious way. Saito grabbed a wastebasket and started walking toward the backyard. What are you doing? I asked. Taking care of, of James, he said, trying to use a gentle tone, as if explaining to a child that it was time for bed. You'll bury him, I said, at the foot of the maple, three feet deep at least. He shook his head. That's not even legal, hun. Besides, I was working all day. I'm exhausted. Three feet deep, I said, and then I went into the garage to find his shovel. The one I located was unused though we must have bought it years ago. I brought it in and handed it to Saito. He took it without a word and went outside. An hour later he came in dirty and sweaty. He 
headed to the shower. I walked to the maple to find the earth there freshly disturbed from digging. Then I found one of James's favorite toys, a fuzzy bird that had once had a bell inside, and affixed it to a stick, which I placed at the head of the grave. At dinner the twins showed up still in their soccer uniforms. They'd spent the day at the park with friends after the game. Happy Mother's Day, said June, somewhat sheepishly. She handed me an envelope with a gift card to Jazzy Juice inside. Thanks, I said. What's Jazzy Juice? It's a smoothie thing, explained Lily. It's twenty dollars. Thank you, I said again, staring at the card. Maybe I was making a face. If you don't want it, I can take it back, said June. My friends and I go there all the time. No, I said. I love it. I'm sure I'll love it. Great, she said, looking disappointed. The next morning I went out into the backyard and screamed. James's grave had been dug up. It was nothing but an empty hole surrounded by a pile of dirt. The stick and the toy were missing too. It didn't seem that deep. By the time Saito ran out to see what was wrong, I was in tears. Three feet deep, I shouted. I said three feet deep. The soil gets really rocky when you go down that far, he said. I figured it didn't matter. It mattered, I screamed. I decided to take some me time that afternoon, so I headed to Jazzy Juice. I tried to figure out the menu while I was in line, but I got overwhelmed by all the options. Finally, when I got to the front of the line, I asked if I could just get a basic orange juice. It would be more like an orange smoothie, said the girl behind the counter, a thin redhead in her twenties covered in tattoos. Oh, that's no good, I said. I don't really like pulp. No pulp, please. That's not really what we do here, she said. Maybe it's a good day to try something new. The Berry Blitz is super popular. I want my orange juice, I said. I was probably a little rude, but I was at my limit. I've got a gift card, I added, for twenty dollars. Fine, she said, and then I swear under her breath she added, boomer bitch. Excuse me? She didn't meet my eyes. Instead she turned and started throwing frozen oranges into a blender. I'm 44, I shouted over the noise as she started the blender. I'm a millennial. Maybe Gen X. Finally, she handed me my drink. It was so pulpy it clogged the straw. She shot me a shit-eating smile. Have a nice day. I chucked my drink in the garbage on my way out the door. That night, I found myself crying as I tried to make dinner. I could see the little hole that had once contained James's body through the kitchen window, and I couldn't help glancing at it as I tried to peel zucchini. It struck me that James had been the only one in the world who loved me at all. Even worse, it seemed unlikely that no one would ever love me again. I was aging, chubby, and boring. The world didn't want me anymore. Without realizing it, I made a deep cut on my thumb and started bleeding everywhere. For a minute, I just watched the blood ooze out of me, all over the vegetables. That night, I heard a thump. I tried to shake Saito awake, but he was dead asleep. Finally, I got up and walked downstairs. There was another thump now, louder, then a series of three more thuds right by the front door. Slowly, I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and then walked through the darkness. As I did, I heard a familiar sound that seemed impossible. It was James's distinctive meow, the little cry he'd deliver at the door when he wanted my attention. And yet it was somehow different now. A lower, deeper mewing. Deeper. Hello? I asked as I walked to the door, but there was no sound now. I heard footsteps outside. Not a cat's, but something bigger. Maybe human. Finally, I reached the door and slowly turned the knob. I opened it just a crack, peeking through to see if anyone was outside. At first, I saw no one. Just the empty street in the moonlight. A few night-blooming flowers had opened their petals, but otherwise the neighborhood looked dull and lifeless. Then I looked down and had to stifle a scream. There, on my doorstep, lay a body, its chest still fluttering with life, but mostly torn to shreds. Great bloody gashes had left the green apron in tatters, the skin's intricate tattoos sundered to islands of nonsense. The girl's red hair was now redder, Though her skull was crushed, her pretty face nearly ripped off the bone, 
I knew immediately it was the girl from the juice shop. My body tensed as I watched her chest cease its fluttering, and the flow of blood slowed to a trickle. Soon, she was still as the rest of the street. Then suddenly, my heart was pounding again, as I realized I was not alone in the darkness. Something dark and massive was moving past the nearby bushes, watching me examine its kill. Though it moved somewhat like a cat, the thing was far bigger, larger than any tiger I'd ever seen at the zoo. As it grew closer, I saw that it was standing on its hind legs, walking toward me, not quite like a person, but like an animal trying to mimic one. I could barely breathe now. It was growing closer. Though it moved slowly, I could sense that it could cover the ten feet between us in a moment, far faster than I could slam the door. Please, I said, and don't. As the creature walked into a slant of moonlight, I realized that it was dressed in a tuxedo. Or were those just the colors of its fur? My queen, I would never, the creature purred in a low voice. I live only to serve you. I looked down at the dead girl by my feet. I would have to call the police I knew. I would have to scream for Saito to come and help. There would be so much to explain. But I wasn't afraid now. That moment had passed. I was here with a friend. James? I asked, and he nodded ever so slightly. You can't do this, I said. I didn't want this. But she was so cruel to you, said James. She called you a very nasty name. I was hiding a few blocks away, but I heard everything. My ears are very sensitive. But you can't just kill people, I said, trying to stuff my growing panic into my stomach. It's not. It's not right. Of course I can, said James. In fact, I must. It's my nature. Never again, I whispered. James cocked his head, looking me in the eyes. What was he looking for? I could stop if you order it, he said. Though that would be unfortunate. You know I love to honor you with gifts. I always have. But go ahead. Make the command and I will disappear, never to leave you another present again. I looked down at the dead girl, all torn to shreds. There was a certain beauty in it, like a stained glass window, sublime in its brokenness. Just say the word, James said again. But I didn't. Thank you, I finally said, bending to look closer at the dead girl. For the gift. It was but a trifle, my queen said the thing, until next time. And then, bowing slightly, he backed away and bounded into the darkness. It was Mackenzie's idea to go camping. In fact, most things we do start out as one of her ideas. Neither of us were exactly outdoor enthusiasts, but we had both grown up in rural towns and did our share of hiking and fishing growing up. So I wasn't exactly daunted by the idea of spending a few days in the woods but I wasn't excited either. School has just let out for spring break, and after another semester of getting kicked by midterms, it was very tempting to give in to my body's desire for a few days of uninterrupted sleep. Uninterrupted sleep, unfortunately, was not Mackenzie's idea of a good time. She had been suggesting the idea to me for weeks beforehand, and I had always brushed her off by claiming I had other things coming up. But by the time the break rolled around, I had run out of excuses and she had already prepared everything with me in mind. So it was decided we left on Sunday. Despite Mackenzie making me wake up before the sun even rose to get on the road, I found myself in a strangely good mood. I had spent most of the previous day either eating or napping, the most uninterrupted rest I had gotten since Christmas. We drove up from Bakersfield, her truck bathed in the light of the desert sunrise. At first we spoke of classes and tests, and then of a camping spot that she had found in the forests of the Sierra Nevada. It wasn't actually a campground, she informed me. It was something called dispersed camping, which means you register a permit with park services and then you pitch a tent wherever you like, which also meant no water, heat, or electricity. Leave it to Mackenzie to make sure everything we do is to the extreme. By the time the desert scenery had bled into the browns and greens of the Sierra foothills, I had rifled through all of our packs. I trusted Mackenzie with the planning, but now that I realized we were going to be a little more off the grid than previously anticipated, I just wanted to make sure. We each had our own private tents and sleeping bags, along with a few days' supply of food and water.
cooking utensils, first aid kits, and other items were divided up between our two packs, which were already stacked high enough to peek over my head when it was on my back. I recognized landmarks near Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon, but Mackenzie took us farther north and I lost track of the terrain. She turned on a trail that led us deeper into the mountains and pulled over when it ended at the foot of a hill. I was out here last week looking around for spots, she said, opening the car door. If we hike around this hill here, there's a sort of little valley with a lake at the bottom where we can set up. I groaned a little as I shrugged on my pack. How long a hike? I asked. I took a step forward and winced at the sound of pots clanging together. Next time I'm packing my own bag, maybe half an hour or so. A little cardio never hurt anyone, I guess. And I bumped the pack higher before tightening the hip strap, trying to keep the weight from dragging on my shoulders. Mackenzie was right. Just around the hill, the terrain dropped dramatically towards a lake at the center of the valley. Almost like a caldera, I just doubt that there used to be any active volcanoes around these parts. Mackenzie led the way down, through some steep ground where I was worried I might slip and roll all the way down into the lake. But the firm dirt made good footing, and the trees made good handholds. Mackenzie suddenly stopped. I heard the rushing of water. I peeked around her shoulder and saw that in front of us laid a stream. Almost a small river if I was being generous. It also led towards the lake, but a bend in the trail meant we had to cross it to continue. The snows up in the mountains must have begun to melt, because the stream had swelled in size, and the log that laid across it was already submerged by a thin layer of water. Only a few more minutes of walking after we crossed this, Mackenzie said, nudging the log with the toe of her boot. It seemed sound enough, despite being underwater. I'd watched out, I said leaning over the stream. There were tiny ripples at the surface, but it looked placid. They say that streams like these only look calm on the surface. Mackenzie snorted out a laugh and stepped onto the log. Yeah, that's why I don't plan on swimming in it. She began to shimmy across, and after a few moments I shrugged and joined her. It wasn't a far crossing, maybe twenty feet, and we were making fast progress, but in the end it was always the little things that got you. A little more than halfway across Mackenzie's foot slipped and she leaned forward to regain her balance. Her sleeping bag, tied to the top of the pack, broke loose from one of its straps, fell forward over her shoulder until it was caught mid-air by the remaining strap. That little momentum was enough. Mackenzie tottered for a split second, and then fell. I was right. The current was fast. She reached out a hand to grab onto the log but by the time she resurfaced, she was already too far downstream. I began to scramble across, in hopes of getting to the other side before she was pulled too far away. I guess some luck was on our side that day. The stream was fast, but it wasn't deep, and it couldn't pull her under. Some twenty yards downstream her pack had caught onto a fallen tree, and that was how I found her, gasping and sputtering. Maybe it was a combination of the adrenaline and the ice-cold water but by the time we stumbled to the spot where we were going to set up camp, Mackenzie was laughing hysterically. She had rolled her ankle during her stint in the stream and was limping on ahead of me while I stumbled after her with her pack, in addition to mine, strapped to me. I don't plan on swimming in it, Mackenzie giggled from ahead of me, and then I fell right into the damn thing. Even I had to smile at that. Despite being stuck with around 60 pounds of supplies, maybe I did need some more action in my life. Now, I really had a story to tell when I got back home. It was just about noon by the time we finished pitching our tents and hung our wet clothes out to dry. Mackenzie began digging a fire pit to cook our lunch as we had neglected to bring a jet boiler. I took this moment to take stock of my surroundings and was pleasantly surprised that we found a genuinely beautiful spot to set up camp. We were by the edge of the lake, where the mountains flattened out and the tree line ended a few yards from the shore. After being in school dorms for nearly a year, the amount of the quiet was almost uncanny. The only sounds being the wind in the trees and the waves breaking against the sand. It was alluring, like a lullaby. Mackenzie cussed beside me. I looked over. She was struggling to get the fire going. Her hands shook as she tried to light another match. 
A small pile of used ones already lay by her knee. Let me try, I said, sitting up. She almost got pulled away by a stream an hour ago, I reasoned. Sometimes the shock only hits you after the adrenaline has gone away. I had more luck, and after the fire got going, the rest of the afternoon and evening went by pleasantly. I rummaged through my pack and found that Mackenzie had packed marshmallows and chocolate for s'mores. I tossed the packaging on the ground and jokingly said, I see my pack was so heavy because it was full of all these essential supplies. Mackenzie grinned and then shrugged innocently. She grabbed the package of marshmallows and began unceremoniously shoving them into her mouth. Aren't those for cooking? I asked and Mackenzie looked up at me with a very well-acted look of confusion. I laughed. When the sun set, both of us agreed to retire early so we could wake up at sunrise to explore the area in the morning. I shimmied into my tent and pulled the zipper closed. I checked my watch one last time before letting the sound of waves lull me to sleep. I woke up in the dark, and something was wrong. The air was heavy and my skin was clammy as if I had just broken a fever. Nothing was disturbed inside my tent, and the outside was still quiet. There was nothing reasonable that could have caused this feeling. It's hard to explain. Thinking back on it, the only conclusion I could come to is that we, as a species, are old. Younger than the forests and mountains, of course, but still old enough. And in that time, we have seen many things. You can conjure up your life experiences and logic all you want. But deep down, there is a part of you that simply knows when something is wrong. And in that moment, I knew. Suddenly, there was a light tapping on the flap of my tent and then a voice. You need to come outside, Mackenzie whispered, and she sounded terrified. I took a few deep breaths and clenched my pocket knife in a white knuckle grip. In a flurry of motion, I unzipped the flap and stuck my face outside. I came face to face with Mackenzie. Her hair was disheveled, and she looked to be on the verge of tears. I opened my mouth, but she clamped a hand down over my lips and motioned for me to be silent. For a few moments, neither of us spoke and the only sound to be heard was our heavy breathing as we stared at each other. But then Mackenzie's eyes slowly drifted away from mine, towards the lake. I saw her pupils dilate until I could barely see the color of her eyes. Run, she whispered. I didn't have time to question her. She leaped up and sprinted into the woods. I didn't waste a second before getting up and following her. The two of us crashed through the undergrowth. Perhaps Mackenzie was clearing the way in front of me because it was strangely easy. Maybe I was simply scared. Mackenzie! I called to the shape in front of me, but no answer. Only the sound of her breathing and the cracking of branches. Mackenzie, what's going on? Still nothing. And then the adrenaline in my system began to run out, and suddenly I stopped. It was dark, almost too dark to see. We had left all our lanterns back at the camp and the canopy practically blocked out any moonlight. We'd been running for several minutes, but there were no cuts on me or branches clinging to my hair. It was like I hadn't been forcing my way through the trees at all. It was as if they were welcoming me. Ahead of me, Mackenzie had stopped too. She was standing still and I couldn't hear her breaths anymore. We have to keep going, she said, her voice strangely level. Not until you tell me what's going, I called back. Mackenzie shook her head. It was even darker where she was standing and I couldn't make out her face. But behind her was some sort of clearing, and the light coming through silhouetted her against the trees. We're almost of the forest, she said. And I saw that she was right. There was nothing I would not give to be out of this god-forsaken forest. But no, it couldn't be. It took us half an hour to hike here and that was downhill. The forest could not end here. I was being reeled in like a fish chasing a worm on a hook. Mackenzie turned around and as she did, she took a step towards me. An impossibly huge step. She had been several yards ahead and now we were almost face to face. I ran. I turned around and I ran like I was being chased by the devil himself. If the trees had been welcoming on the way in, they were the opposite on the way out. Branches caught on my clothes and cut my arms and face. I kept on stumbling over tree roots and rocks, but I was undeterred. Behind me, I heard her running after me, but it didn't sound like Mackenzie any longer. It sounded like... like it had four legs. I wasn't even tempted to turn around, 
I was too focused on running and my eyes stayed locked on the light that marked the end of the tree line. I practically dove onto the beach and fell hard onto my hands and knees. I felt the bones in my wrist crunch at the landing. I continued to crawl until I was almost in the water before I turned around. There was nothing there. I wasn't far from our tents, and I watched in wonder as Mackenzie's tent unzipped from the inside and she stepped out. What are you doing? She asked groggily. I ran towards her and practically tackled her into a hug. It was thanks to Mackenzie that we both didn't fall, because in that moment, my knees gave out. There's something in the forest, I said, and to her credit, she immediately grew serious. Did you see someone? She asked, scanning the dark line of trees looming over us. No, I said. Well, yes, but I, I don't know. And at that moment, I didn't want to tell her what I saw, because speaking of it makes it all the more real. Something tried to lure me into the forest, I said at length. But I don't think it's human. Mackenzie just stared at me. For a split second, I thought she was going to call me insane. But it never came. We need to get to the truck, she said. If she had any questions, she refrained from asking them. No, I replied, regaining some of my composure. It wants us in the forest. We're as good as in the forest right now, Mackenzie reasoned. The truck is right there. We need to leave. I looked up and I could see the glint of the truck in the moonlight at the top of the hill. It seemed so close. I outran it once. We could do it again, and there'll be two of us this time. Once we're there, we'll drive, and we won't stop until this freak show is hours behind us. We could be in Bakersfield by morning, but no, no we couldn't, because the truck is more than a mile away, tucked away behind some hill. We shouldn't be able to see it from here, it was simply impossible, whatever it was. It was a good hunter, I admit. Because good hunters don't chase you with drums and torches. They come at night, and they come quietly, disguised as everything you could want. When you are in the dark, they are a light. When you are trapped, they are escape. And when you are lonely, they are company. I pushed Mackenzie away. Why didn't you wake up when I ran into the forest? I asked. She shrugged and her facial expression clearly showed that she thought I was being an idiot. You were quiet, she replied, but you heard me when I came back. She looked me in the eyes. I guess you were louder. There was a tense moment between us where no one spoke. Then Mackenzie threw her hands into the air in exasperation. What use is this? She shouted. We need to leave. I shook my head and took a step back. No, I said. I'm staying here. She looked at me like I had finally gone insane, but I wouldn't budge. Mackenzie took a step toward me, and I flipped my pocket knife open and pointed it at her. She stopped in her tracks and stared at me. You couldn't say she looked surprised. So it's going to be like this, huh? I nodded and the two of us lapsed into yet another silence. After a while she sat and I followed suit. She talked to me all night. At first she tried to convince me that we needed to leave. She begged me, in fact. She talked about how close the truck was and how dangerous it was to be out here. Then as the night dragged on, she spoke of stranger things. She asked me if I was tired and I didn't reply. You never have to be tired again, she said. I don't just mean tonight. What will you do once you leave? Go back to your life. Work. You will be tired for the rest of your life. You will die tired. She made a sweeping gesture with her hand that encompassed the expanse of trees behind her. You can stay here forever, she said. I promise you will never be tired again. When I didn't answer, she began to speak of her sisters. I knew for a fact that Mackenzie had no sisters. She talked about how they would gather berries for me, and how they would make me a crown of oak leaves to wear. She told me that they stitched clothes with no seams, and made fabrics from the foam of the sea. I was in a trance. She painted pictures in my mind of how they would fashion me flutes and harps, and how we would go dancing through the forest during winter, leaving behind only footprints in the snow. When you sing, she said, smiling, the snows will melt and you will bring in the first flowers of spring. And even so, I did not move, and I did not sleep. Finally, just before the dawn broke, Mackenzie stood. So this is it. And her voice didn't even sound like Mackenzie's anymore. 
A marvelous hunt comes to an end, and she bent at the waist in a mock bow before turning around and walking into the woods. You may leave. She laughed over her shoulder as she melted into the shadows, and her laugh echoed across the valley, making ripples in the water and shaking the trees like the wind. I didn't trust her. I waited until the sun was high in the sky before leaving everything but my knife, and I ran for it. I encountered nothing in the forest on the way back, but I also didn't stop to look. By the time I reached the truck, my legs were burning and I could feel my heart beat in my ears. I am not lying when I say I did not touch the brake pedal even once driving out of those mountains. I never looked behind me either, but the trees casted shadows on the ground as I passed them. And just before I reached the edges of foothills, I swore I saw one in the shape of a woman and I saw it waving. I called park services at the nearest town and gave them a polished version of what happened. They searched the area and found Mackenzie's body face down in the lake, carried there by the current. I don't know what I pulled out of that stream, but it wasn't her. It might sound twisted, but I was relieved to hear the news. I had thought that well, that maybe Mackenzie had never been there with me. That it had planned this whole trip from start to finish. I'm still in shock, but I will mourn for my friend when the time comes. I saw the stream. I knew how shallow it was. Mackenzie should not have died, but it killed her. It murdered her, and it would have murdered me. So as beautiful as its words sounded, I did not stay. It has no power outside. It lives in the forests. I will say it again, it lives in the forests, and when you see it, you will know. At first I was going to post this in a relationship advice subreddit, but as it started getting stranger, I realized it makes more sense here. So every morning my F-35 husband, M-36, would wake up early and cook breakfast for us and our two kids. It was usually eggs and bacon with some toast or biscuits or pancakes. We recently moved into a new three-bedroom apartment in a much older part of the city with this beautiful dark wood furniture already in it. Since it was real wood, the lady renting it out decided it would be too heavy to be worth selling. Well, ever since my husband seemed to have picked up a strange habit, he's always been a bit lazy with cleaning up after cooking, so I'd always have to take the used eggshells out of the carton and throw them away for him. After we moved into the new place, I was proud of him. There'd never be eggshells in the carton, so I assumed he'd taken the chance amid all the chaos to fix a few of his bad habits. Well, cue one random Tuesday morning. It was a work holiday at my office, but everyone else was out of the house. I decided to sweep and dust the place thoroughly, which we hadn't done since we'd moved in a month or so prior. I found a lot of dust bunnies and some coins and knickknacks, but by far the strangest thing I found was when I got to the wardrobe in our bedroom. It stood about four inches, ten centimeter, I think, off the ground on hand-carved clawed feet. When I peered under it, there was a lot of dust and spider webs, but behind it were eggshells. Admittedly, I jumped a little when I first saw them, but I pretty quickly realized, well, assumed, they were just regular eggshells. Maybe seven or eight. I swept them out from under the wardrobe and threw them away. I figured they were from the previous owner though I was thoroughly confused by why they'd be there of all places. I cleaned again the next weekend. This time I found eggshells under the couch. Pale white, slightly bigger and slightly slimy. They must have been recent. That, and the fact I'd cleaned under the couch last time ruled out the previous tenants as a source of the shells. I still wasn't sure if I wanted to bring it up with my husband. It seemed too strange of a thing to do intentionally, so I racked my brain for other explanations. Maybe they got knocked under there unintentionally. But how would that happen half a dozen times? Maybe they got dragged under there by an animal? But we didn't have pets. And thankfully, no issues with rodents or other critters. Maybe one of our kids fished them out of the trash and put them there. But Zoe was too young to get into the trash can. She could barely walk yet. And Nick, well, Nick could have done it. He was seven, but I still couldn't think of a motive. Over the following weeks, this happened several more times. Once it was in a dusty corner of the pantry, but both other times, it was the wardrobe again. 
I started getting increasingly curious, almost disturbed by the occurrences. It was a part of my morning routine, before anyone else got up, to check under every piece of furniture, and in the corner of every closet and pantry with a little pen light, to check for shells from the previous morning without being interrupted. It had gotten more frequent. Pretty much every day I was finding eggshells, almost always under the wardrobe, nestled near the baseboard of the wall, not too far from the radiator. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to just watch my husband as he threw away the eggshells from breakfast, since now that we'd moved across the city, my commute was twice as long and I had to leave before breakfast was ready. He'd still have some toast or oatmeal ready for me though, while I did my hair and makeup. Finally, I decided to just confront him about it, since it was increasingly bothering me. Was this some sort of prank? A strange compulsion? Just his way of getting back at me for always complaining about the eggshells? Surely he knew that I knew, since I'd been cleaning them up every morning from under the wardrobe. When he got home from his job, inspecting shipping crates one day, I gave him some time to relax, then strode into the bedroom with him and shut the door. We need to talk about the eggshells. He gave a little smile and looked up at me. So you noticed? Of course I noticed. I described to him my annoyance, and how after the first few times, I didn't really find it funny that he left raw eggshells all over the house. In fact, I didn't find it funny the first few times either. I told him to knock it off and stop with the wardrobe thing. Under the wardrobe came his confused reply. I finally took the time to start throwing away my eggshells, since I knew it had always bothered you when I left them in the tray. That's what I was talking about. What on earth are you talking about? I was speechless. So you haven't been leaving eggshells all over the house? Almost every morning I've been finding them. Under the wardrobe mostly, but I've found them in closets, in the pantry, in my bookshelf, in laundry piles, hell, even under the blankets of our bed. If this is some sort of prank, you've definitely gotten me good. His look of confusion was amplified. Who do you think could Nick be doing it? Or is this some sort of prank on me? It can't be Nick. He's too squeamish around raw eggs. I tried testing the waters to see if it was him. He wouldn't even bring me an uncracked egg when I was baking cupcakes. Nick had always been a germaphobe, so his unwillingness to touch raw eggs didn't strike me as an act. Are there any shells under there from this morning? I had never considered checking under the wardrobe in the evening, so I did. I dropped to my knees and peered under it, and nothing. What about the other places? Intrigued, I grabbed my pen light. I'd been finding something every morning for the last week, so if there were any shells, I was sure I'd find them. I checked all the usual places. Nothing. I checked the kids' beds, the kitchen cabinets, under the fridge. Still not a sign of eggshells. They must be being moved there overnight, I said, puzzled. I had never connected this to the eggshells, but I started noticing this odd, skittering noise in the middle of the night. I would awaken, usually between midnight and 2 a.m., to a strange clicking, like claws on the hardwood floor. It would go away after a second, so I assumed it was the house settling, or maybe a ceiling fan downstairs rattling the floorboards. Rodents had been an early thought of mine, but a call to the previous tenants and a knock at my neighbor's doors confirmed Nobody had ever had issues with mice, and we'd never noticed food going missing, holes being gnawed, or droppings. I couldn't understand why mice would move eggshells around, but it was the most likely explanation I had, so I put out some humane cage traps with lures. One night I woke up and heard the skittering again. This time I grabbed my pen light and walked out into the kitchen. I shone it around, but the skittering faded off and stopped. On the way back to bed on a whim, I peered under the wardrobe. At first I thought I saw the shells again, but then I realized I was mistaken. They were uncracked, whole eggs. My curiosity turned to shock, then to revulsion as I realized they weren't ordinary eggs. They were larger, more rounded, slightly moist, and slightly translucent. I could even see darkish blobs floating inside the eggs. It took all of my self-control to not scream in horror, but I jumped and slammed my head into a shelf in the open, per usual, wardrobe. It woke up my husband who came to his senses instantly, jumped out of bed, and asked if I was okay. 
I held on to the part of my head that I'd hit, wincing in pain, but managed to gesture under the wardrobe with the pen light. After looking at my head to make sure it wasn't bleeding, he cautiously peered under the wardrobe with the flashlight. Oh my god, I heard him say. We whispered for a few minutes, unsure what to do. We couldn't think of any animal that laid eggs like that. We knew we needed to get rid of them, but didn't know where to put them, or how to pick them up. We certainly weren't going to touch them. I shuddered to think of all the times I'd touched those shells with my bare hands, once they'd mostly dried. My skin crawled as I realized whatever was hatching from those had done so possibly, hundreds of times under that wardrobe. We settled on using a dinner plate and a spatula to gather up the eggs and walk them downstairs and dump them in the dewy grass. My husband had suggested throwing them off the balcony, but I didn't like the idea of killing whatever was growing in those eggs. Despite not knowing what it was, what if they were something cute? They were not something cute. The next night was by far the most horrifying night of my life. I'm going to warn you up front. You might want to just stop here if you've experienced something similar long ago in your life, because you'd rather not know what it actually was. But here goes nothing. I felt a bit on edge ever since last night. I'd struggled to sleep at all, so I grabbed an iced coffee from the fridge and pulled an all-nighter writing in my journal about what had been happening and how my life was going. As the sun rose, I started feeling a little silly and figured the eggs were something innocuous though I still didn't have the slighted clue what. I went to work, albeit with a bad headache, and everything seemed fine. I didn't bring up the eggs with my co-workers, since they would probably think I was crazy or be grossed out and suggest something drastic, like fire. Maybe I should have considered that route. That night I checked the house for eggs, then went to sleep, and was awoken by the usual skittering. This time, though, it was followed up by a muffled metallic clang and much more violent skittering. My heart skipped a beat. The trap must have caught some sort of animal in the house. I considered rousing my husband, but I figured I'd be brave. I took the pen light and peered cautiously around the door. The island counter blocked my view of the trap. As I carefully circumnavigated the counter, I caught a glimpse of the trap and screamed. It held a spider-like, gray, hairy creature, about the size of a rat, or a small dinner plate if you counted its legs. I dropped the light in shock, and it broke engulfing the room in darkness. I heard more skittering behind me, and a hiss from the monster in the trap. My eyes were still adjusting to the darkness, but I could see movement out of the corner of my eye. I squared off with one of the creatures, which had its legs bent, as if it was about to leap straight at me. Looking around frantically, I realized my only remaining option, up. I grabbed the cord to the attic door and pulled. Something soft and light fell on my head and rolled off my back, but I grabbed the ladder and yanked it down, never taking my eyes of the spider thing, its eyes glowing in the faint moonlight. I scrambled up the ladder to the attic, and the last thing I remember is seeing hundreds, maybe thousands of tiny pinpricks of light blinking. My family experienced something I can't explain, and we've stopped talking to each other. I don't know what to do. I don't want to sound crazy. We're normal people. If any of this sounds familiar, please reach out to me. I need to know what's happening to my family. It's hard to know where to begin. I don't know when this all started, but it hasn't stopped. I live with my wife and two college-age daughters. I'm a private chef. My wife is a teacher. We live in a suburb outside a coastal U.S. city in an 80s-era planned community where every house and street feels like a mirror image. Crisp lawns, HOAs, everyone knows everyone. The people are a little bland, but we have a yard and a pool, and we can pay for groceries, and we can barely afford to send our kids to college out of state. We were lucky, I thought. My first experience with the supernatural was last spring. Okay, you're really gonna hate this one, Sarah said. It was Monday, my Saturday, and I was grilling vegetables by the pool. My eldest daughter, a born trickster, sat on the least broken pool chair, bombarding me with the most willfully ignorant pop music she could find, or terrible cooking videos, or clips of classic cars refurbished with electric motors, anything to get a reaction out of her poor Gen X dad. Please no. How about the guy who makes things out of chocolate? I countered, hoping for a compromise. I'm looking for the Kings game you went to in 2006 where they lost 1-10. to 10. 
Sarah jabbed. I'm burning your food on purpose, I quipped. Wait, Sarah said suddenly still. Whatever this thing is, whatever these things are, my wife and my daughters feel it before I do. I don't know if they're more sensitive to it or what, but they always know something is there before me. Call it women's intuition. What's wrong? As I said it, I remember it got very quiet. Like the volume for the outside world turned all the way down. The birds, the traffic, and the white noise of suburbia went silent. I couldn't even hear the sizzle of the vegetables cooking two feet in front of me. The lack of sound didn't bother me, however, because I saw something in the sky. A disc. I didn't want to see a disc. But I saw a disc. It was made of metal, perfectly smooth, no rivets, no seams, no wings, no exhaust. A perfectly formed metal disc, 15 feet wide, like two contact lenses stuck together just sitting there. There were lights, big ones, bright in the sun even in the middle of the day, moving all around it. I remember thinking, really? Part of me was exasperated at how, well, dumb it looked. Like an old movie model. Only somehow, I knew it was real. And I was being watched. And then I felt the fear. If you ask me, I think the craft makes people feel it. I don't know. I know it sounds crazy. It's like a madness. It fills you up. Cold. Just pure terror. As soon as your eyes see a craft, in a few seconds your mind blanks, and you feel only fear of the thing in front of you. The disc-shaped ones, and the triangle-shaped ones, they always seem to broadcast the fear. I'd never felt panic like that. I know how to deal with it a little easier now. But back then, I wanted to put my daughter in the car and drive as far away from the thing as possible. Only I was completely frozen. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I could only move my eyes, and even that took tremendous effort. I struggled to look in my daughter's direction and saw she was equally paralyzed. Her pupils turned to me, then back to the craft. And we did that for a few seconds, trying to process what was happening, looking to the disc, to each other, and back. It was agony, and then the disc was gone. I was looking right at it. It didn't fly away. It didn't zoom off at incredible speeds. It was like it stopped existing while I was staring at it. When it was gone, I could move and I could breathe, and my daughter started crying, and I comforted her, and we swore and shook. What the hell was that? Are you okay? I remember we both asked that. I remember reaching for my phone, but it was dead. Sarah's phone was dead, too. We went inside to charge them, still in a daze. Your face is really red, said Sarah, concerned. I caught my reflection in the hallway mirror. She was right. My face was burned, like a sunburn. I wear sunblock every day and often work long hours in the sun. I never get sunburned. I'll get you some aloe. Sarah said, retreating into the downstairs bathroom. I glanced at the oven clock. It was three hours later than I expected. Three hours, I muttered. We were only outside for a few minutes, right? Sarah's eyes widened in realization. What happened to us? Sarah said softly. We were missing time. I don't know where that time went. I don't know what happened during that time. Time feels weird around these things. It's hard to describe. We didn't talk much for a while. We just kind of sat in the living room, scrolling our phones. The evening darkened. I remember thinking I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what. My wife Lauren and our youngest daughter Danny, returning home from work, broke us out of our malaise. A UFO burned your face? Lauren said, incredulous. Lauren was always funny, even when she wasn't trying to be. I won't lie, it sounded dumb. I tried to think of how to word it better. I saw it too, it was really weird. Sarah said seriously. You sure you weren't standing too close to the grill again? Danny teased. Her pants were covered in flour and oil. Her hair pulled back. Danny worked at a restaurant despite my objections. You're supposed to make the food in the restaurant, not on your outfit. I teased back. Danny smirked. She liked kitchen talk. She was a lot like me in that way. I don't understand. Did you provoke them? Why'd they come all the way from space just to burn you? Lauren asked. 
spreading student tests on the dining room table. Did it look like the ones we saw when we were kids? Danny asked Sarah. No, this one was different. It was a different shape, Sarah said, shaking her head. What are you talking about? Which ones? I asked, confused. Do you remember the night we saw the blue elf? Danny asked. Memories of Sarah and Danny as kids flooded my brain. One night, a brilliant blue light in the sky. Sarah and Danny ran into our room to hide. The feeling of someone watching. The memory filled me with dread. Feeling uncomfortable, I tried to change the subject. I don't want to cook tonight. Let's order out. What should we get? I said, presenting a distraction. We ate dinner as a family that night. We talked about normal things. I tried to seem unbothered, but I was obsessively turning over the sighting of the disc in my mind. What was that? Why couldn't we move? The feeling stayed with me long after the meal had ended and the dishes were done. I remember that was our last normal dinner. I wish I'd made more of an effort that night. We'll never be the same family we were then. I guess before I tell you about that night, I should explain what an orb is. An orb is a kind of floating sphere. It looks kind of like a blue basketball filled with spaghetti-looking strands of... something. It has a mind, I think. I don't know what these things are. From what I can tell, they are unknowable. They will harm you. If you see an orb, my advice is to run. They can move through walls. The first night with the orbs changed all of our lives forever. We stopped talking after that night. I don't know if I can write it down in detail yet. Even this was hard. I read something recently. Scientists have communicated with apes via sign language since the 1960s. In all that time, apes have never asked a question. Maybe they can't conceive of what a question is. Their mind just can't form the reasoning to understand how to think of one. I think that's what it's like when we see these things. These orbs, or discs, or whatever. Like we're seeing something we can't comprehend. I don't think we think about aliens the right way. They're not from another planet. They're from somewhere else entirely. Something has happened to my family. Something happened and we're still dealing with it and I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to tell people. We're afraid to talk about it with each other. I'm not even sure if anyone will read this. The world needs to know what's out there. What my family experienced. My family can't be the first. There must be others. If you're still with me after these ramblings, thank you. The next part will not be easy to write. But you deserve to know the full truth about what the orbs did to us. What they're capable of. For now, I present to you this information. I do not think we live in a completely material world. There are supernatural forces all around us, and most of them are unkind. Be careful with how you think, and what you think of. Lee. My dad was military, so we had to move the summer before my senior year in high school. I wasn't taking it well. Senior year is supposed to be special graduation parties, prom, senior pranks. Instead, my senior year became memorable for a far darker reason, one that still keeps me up at night. Once school started, I kept to myself, sitting in a secluded area inside, next to the cafeteria, before the bell rang. I didn't know anyone, so I figured, why not? About two weeks in, I noticed it. One Monday morning, someone had drawn a doodle on the wall next to my chair. Next to the doodle was a speech bubble like in a comic book. It simply said, Hello. The doodle was basic. A circular head with black eyes and a big toothless smile. Stick figure arms waving. I thought it'd be funny to write back. So I pulled out a sharpie and wrote, Hello. That was all. The next day I returned to my spot and to my surprise someone had written back. It read, Nice to meet you. What's your name? Weirdly, there was no trace of my previous writing. I wrote my name and thus began our correspondence. The person would ask basic questions and I would answer. Whenever I asked anything about them they simply wrote, I'm your friend. The doodle itself changed slightly each time, sometimes a thumbs up, 
sometimes a wink. I was amazed at how clean the doodle looked every time. I thought maybe the janitor was writing to me and painting over the wall to reply. The following Monday things got weird. That morning the doodle wasn't smiling. It had angry eyebrows and hands on its hips. The text read, Where were you? It caught me off guard. Did this person come back over the weekend to continue talking? I wrote back. It was the weekend. What the fuck? At lunch, I decided to eat at my spot. I looked over at the doodle, expecting it to have the same text from the morning, but it had changed again. It read, Don't leave me again. Friends don't leave friends. I thought whoever was writing to me was either kidding or taking this too seriously. I wrote back, Goodbye, with a sad face. That was the last time I replied. I avoided that area out of annoyance, hoping the artist would get the hint. I made a couple of friends and started hanging out with them in the morning. After a couple of weeks I nearly forgot about the doodle, but then it came back. One morning, I opened my locker to find it completely trashed. On the back wall of the locker was that damn doodle, more detailed this time, with teary eyes. The text read, Why did you leave me? We were friends. Whoever this was had taken it too far. I told my new friends and they wanted to see it. When I opened my locker, everything was clean. They thought I was messing with them, but I was unnerved. How did they do that? I grabbed everything from my locker and never used it again. The following week in second period, I got scared. I walked into class to see students gathered around my desk, talking frantically. Someone had scribbled all over my desk. You're a bad friend. In the middle of the desk was a squashed cockroach. The way it was killed made it look like the doodle. I spoke with my teacher and told her everything. She asked me to show her the doodle, but it was gone from every place it had been. I felt like a freak. People moved on from the desk incident after a few days, and I kept my head low. My friends were a good distraction as we joked around and talked about anime. I never mentioned the doodle to them again. Several weeks passed without incident. I thought it was over. But there was one more encounter. During fourth period I went to the bathroom. No one else was there. When I closed the stall door, there it was again. This time, the doodle was more detailed, screaming and clawing at its face. The words, I'll kill you, were scrawled all over the door. I'd had enough. I grabbed toilet paper and tried to wipe it off. The smear turned red like blood. No matter how much I wiped, the red ink remained. It looked like I was smearing blood all over the door. My hand was covered in red ink. I ran to the sink, but the more water and soap I used, the larger the red stain became. I looked like my hand was bleeding. I grabbed a paper towel, but it just stained it. The stain made me run home. The paper towel had the doodle's screaming face in red ink. It took a long time to clean my hands completely. I now hated going to school. Every day I was scared of what I might find. The bathroom showed no sign of ink, red or black. But one day, at my second period desk, there was a note in the corner. I'm sorry. Goodbye. With a small broken heart next to it. That was the last note I ever received from my mysterious pen pal. At the beginning of the next semester, I saw another student writing something on the wall where I used to sit. Was this my stalker? I went over to confront him, but then I saw the doodle, just as it had been. He was writing back to it. I wanted nothing to do with that, so I left. Three weeks later, that boy was reported missing. He just disappeared one day. One morning, walking to first period, I stopped to tie my shoe near my old spot. I looked at the wall. The doodle was there, but with another one next to it. I got closer and thought, that looks like the missing guy. The second doodle was screaming. The text above them read, do you want to be our friend?